How are you going today? Ooh, pretty suppressed today. So am I. So if that... <laughs> well, you're probably suppressed because I am. Isn't it? <laughs> it's probably all my fault. <laughs> Last weekend was a bit intense. Yeah. You rocked the boat a bit, did it? You're open to anything now. <laughs> Any concept of yourself is acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Well, today I was going to do the talk about uh, the world's definition of love, but uh, I'm personally not in the space to give that talk today, so I won't be giving that talk today. So sorry about those of you who've come expecting to have that particular talk delivered. I just feel that I'm not in the good space to deliver it myself. I need to feel some more grief and uh, once I feel that, I'll be in a better space. So what, I, what, we've done, what I'll do today is that I've got no idea what I'm going to do today <laughs> as a result of that. And uh, I was going to leave it open to yourselves actually as to what you would like to talk about today or whether you would just like it to be a general question and answers that you'd like to be involved in today. So it's up to you today, and I'm happy to answer questions about any subject, so um, including personal ones. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions if you want about different types of subjects. But I thought that we'd do that today, if that's all right with you. So today will be just a general question and answer discussion today. Uh, who's got our microphones? Uh, so Joy up one side, and Pierre's handling this side, are you? Yep. And you know about just being careful about walking in front of the cameras for both of you. That would be good. Okay, who would like to start? Nina, you would like to start? So let's start. Hi, AJ. I felt that um, there was probably a lot of material that you wanted to cover last week about the sleep state that you didn't. Uh, there was, yes. Um. But I want to do a sleep state part two discussion at some point, because it will take a longer than just a few moments. Okay, I yep. won't ask any more about sleep state then. <laughs> um, yes, there was a lot of information that I would like to have covered uh, in addition to what we covered last week, because I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, firstly, what happened in a negative way about the sleep state, uh, which we did cover a fair bit of last week, but we didn't get to cover all the positive things that go on in your sleep state. And I'd like to cover those things next with the discussion about spirit life. So um, there are just lots and lots of positive things that you can engage your sleep state for to help you progress in your awake state. And most people are not aware of that, but uh, there's so much that you can do um, in your sleep state to help you in your awake state and help your soul grow. So, um, so what I'd like to do is talk about that as another aspect of the sleep state discussion when we have another three or four hours that we can make, have that discussion. The reason why I feel it's going to need that amount of time is because uh, once we talk about the possibilities, a lot of you will go, so we can do this, so we can do that. And you know, there'll be a lot of those kind of questions. So what about this? Could I do that? And, and we'll be able to actually uh, work through a lot of different things that are possible in the sleep state that can help you in the awake state as a result of knowing the truth about the sleep state completely. Mm. Can't have that talk now? No, I'm not really in the space to have that talk now either, really. Um, there's uh, so many things um, that are very important to understand about your sleep state. Um, and and if, if we understand them completely, you will see how to engage your sleep state in a positive way, as well as what happens when you engage your sleep state in a negative direction. So for, for many of us, because we have not been conscious of what's going on in our sleep state, we've been engaging our sleep state in quite a negative direction. But, but once we become conscious of our sleep state and what's the possibilities that, are, that we have there, um, we can engage our sleep states in a lot of very positive directions as well to help our soul progress. And uh, I want to discuss those things in detail with you, yeah. So we'll do that 
we might even make uh, that our next discussion at Mergen or something like that. Um, it just depends a bit. Our next discussion in Mergen was going to be some mediumship, but it depends upon how clear Mary feels on the day. So we might have two, you know, the option of the other talk if, if Mary's not feeling clear to do the mediumship on the day. Does that make sense? Yep. Any other questions that you have? Great. You've said that when six sphere natural love spirits change to the divine love path, they often have to go back down to a fourth sphere or something. The third. Yep. Third, okay. Yep. Um, can the same thing happen when you're changing from natural love to divine love from a lower sphere? Like I feel that I you know, had more truth intellectually and, and morally, but now having to, I have to feel like I've had to step back to embrace emotional truth. Yes, and what you raised is a very good question, Graham. So if I can just illustrate it as the spheres grow. So if this is the first, second, third, fourth, and then fifth and sixth sphere, um, when, when most people are in a religion of some type or and they're very sincere in the way they practice their religion, or they're on the, what you would call the new age sort of path beliefs, but they're very, very sincere about how they practice those particular beliefs. Most people have a very clear intellectual viewpoint of what is moral and also what is uh, loving in terms of an intellectual, from an intellectual perspective. And so you could say for many people, they have progressed at least to the second sphere and often to the third and sometimes even to the fourth in, on earth in a very intellectual way in terms of they're, they're trying hard to practice the principles of love in their day-to-day -day life. And, and for many, they love animals and so, uh, you know, they don't eat meat anymore. They, they love um, other people and so they practice a, a life of giving rather than a life of just getting for themselves. And many practice, uh, have no clear concept of God perhaps, but practice some strong uh, feeling, they have some strong feelings inside of them about the need to have integrity, personal te integrity and honesty. And so even though they feel drawn sometimes to do a dishonest thing or uh, have a lack of integrity, their intellect kicks in and stops them from doing such things. So you could say that they're, they're intellectually... ...understanding the principles of love and, and um, truth to a degree. And, uh, and a, as a result of that, they uh, feel that they are progressing. They feel that they understand things quite well from an intellectual perspective and they feel they are progressing. The only problem is, is that in that path there's a lot of things we're not learning about emotions and emotional truth and the condition of our soul in comparison with our intellect. So remember if we drew our bodies, right, our spirit, our material body, our spirit body and then our soul, so that's our soul, our spirit, sorry, spirit body and physical body. The brain of the spirit body is what's dominating the individual, usually in that case. In other words, the brain of the spirit body has worked out a lot of th intellectual truths, and as a result, the brain is quite dominant. The, the, you could call it the spirit body's mind, if you like, is the brain of the spirit body, is the dominant aspect of their being. So that's what causes them to do most things in their day-to-day -day life. Now, once we start to grasp the divine love path, and this is a, is a transition to go to the divine love path, and we realise that everything is soul-centric. So now we're starting to focus on what is really in my soul, not what do I think is in my soul, or what do I hope is in my soul, is usually what it is. We hope that things are in our soul that is not there. And so what happens is we start to go through this transitional period where we're less determining truth with our mind 
and we're trying to see whether we actually feel that truth in our soul or not. Now initially that transition takes time and, uh, and it depends how intellectually dominant we've been as to how long it takes. But once we get to the point where our soul becomes the dominant and, and that actually occurs during the transition in the seventh sphere um, and up until then we're learning how to let go of the mind, the spirit body's mind and the spirit body's concepts and actually learn more and more about living just in the soul, living in the feelings. What do I feel and only living it? And in fact, you don't even ask yourself anymore what you're feeling. You just live in the feeling, whatever that is. And because it's mostly harmonious with love, um, it, you're not damaging yourself or anybody else in that place which is a very different place here because you can be in your mind acting in harmony with what you believe to be love and truth but at the same time coming out of your emotions might, uh, might out of your soul might be all of these sort of jagged emotions if you like anger fear and other emotions might be coming out of your soul at the same time so in that place even though you think you're not damaging anybody and you're attempting to not damage anybody in your day-to-day -day life, the reality is because it's still coming out of your soul, it is still damaging your environment, damaging people, damaging plants, animals, everything in your environment actually. And, it, and it's the soul's attractions that determine what's going on in terms of your day-to-day -day life, in terms of your law of attraction for your day-to-day -day life. What, when I say your law of attraction, your soul has a condition that attracts events to it, trying to correct the unhealed emotions or the unhealed love in your soul not corrected in your mind so it's trying to correct this and not this and so for, for many of us when we hear about the divine love path we first learn it intellectually and we develop intellectually here by learning a whole new set of concepts and truths that are God's truths, that we have a feeling of God's truths, but we are still not embracing them from anything other than our mind. So for many of us over the last three or four years, you've heard a lot of concepts in your mind and you've embraced them in your mind to a, to a degree, but they're yet to actually be inside of your soul. Because once they're inside of your soul, you cannot do anything else. It's impossible. So, so once you're inside, it's inside of your soul, for example. Once a moral issue, for example, about looking at a woman, say, let's say you're a male and you're so used to looking at women sexually, you know, looking at them as sexual objects through your life, once you deal with that inside of your soul, you physically and emotionally do not look at a woman like that anymore. It's just gone from you altogether. You don't have to try. Whereas if you're on the intellectual path, you'd be noticing, oh, I looked at the woman again, looked at the woman again, and you'd be trying to not look or trying to do things that cause you to not look, for example. That's a very different condition. One's a condition where you're trying to do something. The other one's a condition where you are actually doing it and not having to try at all. So this is actually when you're in your soul completely, it's a very relaxed state. It's not doesn't feel pressure, you don't feel huge amounts of pressure or intense. It's a very relaxed and peaceful sort of a state in, in your soul. But the transition is very difficult. And it's the transition that most of us resist. We feel we're going crazy. Uh, that's usually one of the primary feelings. But there's also lots of other feelings we have in attempting to stop being dominant here and start actually feeling our way through things. So, so you go through this place that you say you're going through, Graham, and this place where you sort of feel like you knew more before than you know now. And you do actually go through that, that, that phase, if you like, where before you knew all this stuff, but it was all intellectual knowledge that you put into practice in your day-to-day -day life because you felt strongly about the intellectual knowledge but that's a totally different thing than having that same knowledge in your soul and dominating your actions from your soul and that is a very different place the two places i i have to you know emphasize that it's so different that the majority of us are not even understanding yet how different those two places are. So the majority of us hear a talk like last week, for example, about the facade self, and then we try not to be our facade self. 
because we, we've heard all these things about you know how dangerous it is or damaging it can be so we try not to be our facade self but we're still doing it with our mind it's not yet a feeling where we don't want to be our facade self anymore and a, and a feeling that drives it now that it's impossible for us to be our facade self anymore and it's not yet a feeling so we can actually learn things with our mind that we're yet and sometimes years away from learning in our soul and yet at the same time we're thinking we know it in our mind and that often prevents us from knowing it in our soul yeah when, um, when i first encountered your descriptions of the spheres i had thought mm, based on my own experience i'm in third sphere yep because i based my life on truth and honesty and, and yep. that sort of stuff. Yep. But I've just been realising that I, I've got to go back to embracing emotional honesty and that puts me back in first view. Exactly. And, and so many people, this is what many people struggle with the divine love path. The reason why they struggle is because they have often progressed on the natural love path, particularly people who are sincere like yourself, have progressed on the natural love path quite significantly on earth and yet once they come to terms with the fact that the divine love path everything's happening in the soul and they go wow like i don't even really feel my soul let alone know how to get feelings into or truth into it and actually become stable within me as a result and so it feels like a regression and because it feels like a regression the majority of people do not wish to embrace it for that reason because it feels like you're having to step back and one of the primary reasons why we don't want to embrace it is because of a f there is this underlying feeling that we develop when we've developed in self-reliance there is generally a bit of arrogance involved in the self-reliance where i've done this i've had to do it for myself i've had to feel it myself i've had to work through it myself i know it and there's this very strong feeling of self-reliance in that place that you now don't want to give up either because it feels good it actually feels quite satisfying and uh, and so for many of us it's difficult to give up that feeling and go well how does god see me rather than how, how do i see myself and what is really in my soul rather than what i think is in my soul and they are two very different places and you'll notice that some of the recordings on the net that I've put on the net about my t discussions with six fear sp spirits they often come thinking they've learned something and then during the discussion we start talking about the emotions that they actually still hold within them that they thought they'd already dealt with and it's very hard for them at that point to actually allow themselves to go into the emotion because it feels like a regression it feels like they're sort of going backwards rather than going forward yeah uh, but it's an essential part of actually learning this single way that god provided so remember that god's path is he is our soul he is god god has only one way to connect to you and it's a way god created so it's got nothing to do with what man thinks nothing to do what any single person on earth has ever thought so the problem for many of us is that we've taken up teachings that other people or other other men and women on earth have thought and therefore created so even a religion is like that most of it comes from the thoughts of people putting together into a into a doctrine of some kind that then a group of people practice now the path to god is none of those ways the path to God is God's way of love and truth. So, so God's way is very simple in the sense that this soul has to remove from itself this umbrella that it constantly has where it's trying to or is preventing God's love from flowing into it. And the soul itself has its will, through its own will, established that umbrella and the soul therefore through its own will needs to remove the umbrella but then also through this process become more reliant on god not intellectually but actually a feeling of more reliance in the sense of day-to-day -day life you know you're more reliant just because you can feel it and that's very very different and so what happens is for the majority of people on earth they'd like to connect to god many people who are religious really want to connect to god but 
because they're not embracing God's way and want to embrace their own, it prevents the connection from occurring. And then when they realise they've been embracing their own for a period of time and have to embrace God's now if they really want to connect to God, what they finish up doing is feeling like they're going backwards and that then triggers feelings of a lack... It, it, it triggers feelings where they're feeling confronted with their ego and then as a result of being confronted by the ego, they then want to maintain or hold on to self-reliance. So it's a process we've got to go through to release that. So, so if you just remember that the, the path that I'm describing is not my path. It, it never has been my path. So right, even in the first century, it was never my path. It was a path that I discovered that God had designed for all humans. Uh, not just for one or a few humans, but all humans, if they want to connect to God, this is the only way to connect to God. It's the only path. But it's not designed by a person. and it's, it, it, it's up to each person to want to discover it for themselves. But it's not designed by a person. It's not like a... There's a bit of ringing now, Igor. If you can just chuck my volume down a little, maybe. Um, it's not a um, path that is able to be defined intellectually by a person on earth because the path itself was created by God and we all we can do on earth is discover it and do it that's all we can do that's all I've ever been able to do and that's all anybody who finds the divine love path can do is to discover what God intended with the, with our soul and then do that it feels to me like that it feels to me like there's a part within me that God's designed, built into me, and it's my access to God, I feel, is through feeling that lack within myself. You know how you've often described about how six fear spirits, the only way they progress is by feeling what's missing. Yep. And it feels like I'm sort of trying to get in contact with that within myself, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and that's what's brought me back is by going with that. Exactly. Going, in, going into that hole within myself, what's missing. Yep. And it's a similar, um, in a way it's similar to connection with soulmate is a similar thing too, in that sense that there is this inbuilt place within us that God's created for us to have. And, and we all feel it, but we act it out in denial generally. You know, through denied emotions we do all sorts of things, but not actually get to the real emotion of longing or missing God or longing or missing our soulmate as an emotion rather than a thought or an addiction. So, yeah, it's a very different place in both cases. Um, so the problem for many of us is that we hear all of these truths and we like the feeling of being present with them. Does that make sense? Like we like the feeling of being a part of the truths, but... To, to actually do it means letting go of this umbrella that we've put over ourselves as protection. You could think of it. In reality, what it is, is it's really like a huge barrier, which our facade self, which we talked about uh, a weekend ago, and it's this huge barrier that we place around our soul that prevents anybody from really getting in, let alone God getting in, unless the person meets the addictions of the barrier. In other words, unless... The, the barrier is only able to be permeated when certain addictions are met. And what we're doing in our relationship with God is releasing these addictions that we have, but one of the addictions is our own self-reliance. We're, we're addicted to wanting to define ourselves, ourselves, rather than have God, who created our personality, just say, look, this is the personality I've created you to be. You just need to discover who you are. What we do instead is, no, I don't like that person. <laughs> Uh, nor did my mum and dad like that person and let's face it the majority of people on the earth haven't really liked that person either so what I do is I put her or him in this big shell and then I be that person this new person that I've created and and the problem is that person can progress on the natural love path quite significantly but unfortunately cannot progress at all or very very rarely on the divine love path because to progress on the divine love path, you have to become yourself. And that's very difficult for the majority of us. Yeah. Igor, just straight behind you here. My question is uh, more of a general question. 
about the mind. Yeah. Um, is it true to say that mind is a product of our emotions? Our thoughts and mind is a product of our emotions? What we need to do, Igor, is separate what God created the mind and the brain for from what we're finishing up using it to be. So God created... Uh, yes, mind. God created our mind. Our spirit body's mind is a creation of God, just like our physical body's brain is a creation of God. But we have to look at how God intended it to be used in comparison to how we finish up using it. So, so what's the primary... All right, well, let's look at the difference between the two in terms of how God intended it and then how we finish up using it. Okay, so, so here's our parent, God. Here's our half of our soul. And here's our spirit body. But let's focus on our spirit body's mind in this case. And our physical body. So that's the spirit body, physical body. And let's focus on our spirit, our physical body's brain. So we're talking the brain here and the mind here and the soul. And remember, we're a half of a soul, so, so we're not a complete soul. There's another half of our soul. And once you introduce the other half of the soul into the equation, the feelings become even more complex than what I'm going to describe. And we'll, we'll do that in a minute and introduce the second part and see the relationship. So, so you've got your soul, your spirit body's mind, and your physical body's brain. And what finishes up happening when you first arrive on the earth is that the physical body's brain becomes the primary method of control of your physical body. So in other words, as soon as you're hungry, you want to eat. If you can't eat as soon as you're hungry, what, is it, what do you do? You have a big cry because you're a baby at that point and, uh, and the only way to get fed is to have somebody else do it for you. And so you have a big cry and eventually that cry lets the person who's caring for you know that they need, you need to be fed and so you get fed. So it's an instant reaction, it's a reaction of the brain to these other, these other responses that are occurring within the body. And in fact, the brain itself is interacting with these responses. It tells you, I'm hungry, I need, the body needs food, the body needs rest, the body needs comfort, and so forth. All of those basic things the body needs are told straight away, and the brain responds, and we have an automatic response. So that's the physical body. You could call that, um, what we've called it in the in the um, Paget messages is the animal, if you like. Does that make sense? So that's the part of us that uh, finishes up, uh, if we're not careful with our spirit body, it finishes up becoming animalistic, in fact, where we're just totally driven by our physical body senses. And there are people, historically, um, particularly if you think back to the so-called caveman days, that were driven primarily by these animal instincts and very little other feelings dominated their existence other than the animal instincts that were present inside of the body. So all that was was the brain responding to the body and since there's no other check upon what it decided to do, it just went out and did its thing. So let's say it was hungry and there was no other food other than another person, it would just kill the other person and eat their flesh instead because there's no moral mo no morality driving it so that's what I'd call animal, and the animal part of ourselves we're a physical organism and the physical organism itself is animal in nature very very similar to any other animal just more highly developed in its brain in fact and there's a reason why it's more highly developed in a brain that's related to the spirit body and the soul, but we'll talk about that later, maybe. Okay, so that's our operation of our physical body. The spirit body has a mind of its own, and it has the ability to influence the physical body's brain as well. 
And in fact, this is, it is the physical body's mind that is the primary storage of data, of information, memories. This is why a person who's in their physical body, who has a stroke, where a part of their brain actually dies, they temporarily lose their memory of a certain type. Sometimes it's even of a mem their memory of how to actually use parts of their physical body is lost, but also their memories about different things that have happened in their life often get lost. And then, over a period of time, they regain it all. And that tells us, it's quite obvious, that the physical body's brain does not store the information. The information, because the physical body's brain got damaged, and somehow, when it's got repaired, for some reason, the information that it stored before returns. And even if a part of that brain dies completely, sometimes another part of the brain develops enough to replace some of the functionality. So that tells you that the functionality must come from another location. Does that make sense? Now, it comes from the spirit body's mind, the functionality of all those kind of things. So the spirit body's mind is capable of huge amounts of storage of information and memories and uh, in fact everything that you've ever done uh, for many of us is actually stored in the mind but there are limitations upon the spirit body's mind which we'll discuss in a minute. So far everyone is with me? Yeah. Now the mind can influence the brain and this is what the development of what you would call the higher, a lot of people call the higher self if you like So now the animal, the brute, is no longer the dominant being of a human, but rather the spirit body's mind kicks into play and goes, well, hang a sec, this isn't logical for me to go out and murder another human, particularly if I've got other sources of food available to myself. And if I murder other humans and I'm affecting them and their life, which isn't a very loving thing to do, so we, we can actually start to use our brain, uh, our spirit body's mind's uh, desire to become more moral and we finish up developing. We develop beyond the animal who would just go out and do whatever it wants into this higher being who's capable of determining what it, what it wants and capable of self-determination to a large degree and capable also of understanding the impact of what, it, what the brute wants and curbing the impact in fact. Now, in your day-to-day -day life, you are constantly doing this. You, the animal, you know, wants something to eat. What stops you from just walking outside, grabbing, grabbing a magpie, wringing its neck, pulling off its feathers and eating it? Because that's what the brute would do. Well, there's all sorts of thing in your brain that prevents you from taking those particular actions some of which is a desire for beauty, some of which is a desire to, to um, do things that don't harm other things, some of which is a, just, just a desire to, um, to have something that's a bit tastier than a magpie. Not that I've ever tasted one. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why you might, might choose a different action once you're in this higher self. But the brute would definitely do that given no control, given no other external form of control. And it's our spirit body's mind that can provide a lot of that control. And so what happens is a lot of our spirit friends in particular, but also people on earth, finish up developing this mind, developing through logic, if you like. And we can develop uh, that part of ourselves through logic. Then there's this soul, the soul that the majority of people on earth are totally driven by, actually, but are completely unaware of in the majority of cases. Now, I would call that the true self, not the higher self, but the true self. That is the real you, the true you, the one who you really are. Now, in, there, in that soul, there's a lot of things that God's placed there. 
and God's placed personality, God's placed a desire for love, a desire for truth, a passionate desire to understand yourself and understand the environment and the universe, in other words. A lot of these things are instinctual for the soul. But unfortunately, what happens is because we're quite blocked between the soul and the spirit body, and then often we are also quite blocked between the spirit body, even, and many people are in this state on earth, blocked between the spirit body and the physical body. Unfortunately on the earth, our, spirit, our physical body often dominates much of our thinking still because of its needs. So it's neat. And then the spirit body's denial of different emotions cause it to block the soul. And so the soul has a whole set of needs which don't get satisfied. And so what we finish up doing is coming up through our mind, the usage of our mind, we come up with other ways to satisfy what are standard ways that we could use to satisfy these particular longings in the soul. And so what finishes up happening, if you drew it differently, you'd have your soul, you've got your mind of your spirit body, and then you've got your brain of your physical body. And for most people, that's how they live their life, where that is the highest priority, and this is a less higher priority, and that's the lowest priority. That's how they live their life. Now, of course, that's going to mean that the animal takes precedence over all other things. And then when the animal no longer desires the precedence, in other words, there's no pressing need for the animal to take over, then some of the spirit body will drive the action. And when there's no driving emotional need for the mind to take action, now we're in our, we can feel our soul. But unfortunately for the majority of us, we spend most of the time in between these two places here. Now, once, we, so that, that's how we often then begin to develop on the, the, on the natural love path, in other words, learning how to use love naturally, what we finish up doing is we finish up developing a lot in the mind. So the mind starts to take precedence over the brain. So what finishes up happening, once this happens to a certain degree, and it has never happened completely on earth to a single person, but but it has happened on earth, uh, on the spirit world, to every person who's reached the sixth dimension of the spirit world. What's happening there is their mind, their spirit body's mind is now dominant, and the physical body, if it still existed on earth, would be subservient to it. In other words, the brain would be subservient to the mind. This is where you get some people on earth, and there's all sorts of experiments that have happened in the, spiritual, uh, in the spiritual world on earth about this. This is where you can get people, for example, no longer feeling hungry even if their body is saying, I'm hungry. Right? And they no longer feel hungry. Or you get people where their body is saying, I want some sexual activity, but their mind is saying, you don't need that anymore. Right. So, so in other words, they have a celibate life without any trouble at all maintaining it. Right. You get uh, people uh, doing many other things as a result of this swap over that occurs. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, um, that is developing the mind, in, a, in a, the spirit body basically is now being developed, to dominate the physical animal, and, but unfortunately it also dominates the soul. That's the drawback. So the drawback is you still feel quite distant from the soul's actual emotion. Right? And that's the problem with that. Now the way we want it to be, if, and this is the way God designed it to be, is this way. Where the soul takes the highest, sorry, the soul takes the highest, I wrote down male there for some reason, but the soul takes the highest priority, right? and our spirit body's mind takes the next priority and our brain is of the least significance to us. Our physical body's brain. Now, everything both the physical and spirit bodies do is do just done to serve the soul's desires. And because it's the soul that is capable of connecting to God, we now also have the potential of receiving divine love and this soul growing. You see, 
the soul under the previous description, that anything coming through into the soul in the previous description had to pass through firstly the mind and also even the brain of the animal before it, the soul really embraced it. Now for the majority of people what happens is there's a mixture of things going on on a day to day basis or a moment by moment basis. There are some things where you have no resistance at all in your mind and no resistance at all in your physical body or your physical body's brain to doing and so in those instances your soul is the dominant force. And for, some of, you know, for many of us this is the case in our day to day life. We have some things that are just dominated by our soul. But then for many of us we also have the opposite thing occurring too where our mind has become dominant or our, or our physical demands have become dominant and we just fulfill those first no matter what our soul says. So if our soul's saying, no, no, have some integrity, have some integrity, have some integrity, right? And our, and our animal self saying, I need, I need sex now, I need sex now, I need sex now. Right? And, the, and, the, and the other part's going, no, no, have some integrity, have some integrity, you're married, have some integrity. And if the animal part of us is dominant, then we will finish up going off and cheating on our partnership. That's guaranteed. It's only when our mind or our soul is more dominant on that particular matter that we'll actually have a different action. So for many of us, we have soul dominance in some aspects of our life and then we have completely the opposite in other aspects of our life. So our soul is actually the most subservient thing in our being and our brain, which is just receiving physical stimuli, right? And that becomes the most dominant thing. The physical stimulus that is driving a certain action becomes the dominant thing. Now, if we really, when we become at one with God, the soul is always the dominant thing. There is never any aspect of ourselves that is driven by our spirit body's mind or our physical body's brain anymore. And this gets to how God designed it. So let's look at how God designed it. How God designed it was that the soul controls, without any resistance, controls both the spirit body and the physical body completely. That's how God created it to be. That the soul controls both bodies simultaneously and completely. In other words, the physical body cannot take an action unless the soul decides upon the action. And the spirit body even cannot take an action unless the soul decides upon it. And in fact, during the transition that God designed, which happens between the sixth, the seventh and the eighth dimension, what finishes up happening is that before, up until the sixth dimension, the mind was the dominant factor. But in the seventh dimension, you lose the dominance of the spirit body's mind. And by the time you eat the, reach the eighth dimension, you no longer think about doing things anymore because you're already doing them by the time you thought about them. Right. And... Everything you do is harmonious with love as well, without you having to try, without you having to force the action upon yourself. So the way God designed it was that these two bodies were just the tools of the soul. Do, do you see the difference? Whereas the way we often operate before then is that the soul and the spirit body become the tool of the physical body. Unfortunately for many of us, the animal part of ourselves drives the rest of it. So therefore, the animal part of ourselves, you could say, is the dominant force and the soul and the mind are just its tools to get what it wants done. And it doesn't care often about the results. 
It doesn't care. And the only time it actually finishes up caring is when the soul's condition degrades so much that the primary feeling is one of pain. And once it gets to that point, the physical body usually gives up its dominance and allows there to be some other form of dominance that creates less pain. So unfortunately for many of us on earth, we use our physical body in ways that are totally out of harmony with love. We degrade in our condition. As we degrade in our condition, our pain worsens. Our physical condition worsens. We get old, we get wrinkly, we start getting all like a shriveled up prune in the end. If you look at an older person, really, that's how it is, isn't it? And, and why is that? It's because the soul is getting darker, darker, and now it's having more and more and more and more of an effect on the spirit body. Right? So, and therefore it's having more of an effect on the physical body, it's degrading its condition and eventually we get to the point where we either die and pass in the spirit world and then come to terms with how bad we look because we can now see it in our spirit form or many of us on earth go, wow, I'm starting to feel really bad, I need to change my ways, we go. So like if one of the ways is smoking all the time, and we're starting to cough a lot and we get emphysema and we get all these other things and eventually the pain and we go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got to give up smoking otherwise you're going to die. And we go, okay, I think it's time for me to give up smoking now. So we're willing to now make the physical body subservient to the deeper emotional pain that we're receiving and as a feedback mechanism actually from our soul in a way. And so what's happening is our true self now has to, has to have a bit more dominance, otherwise we will die. And we're afraid of death and so fear causes us to decide in our mind that we should take a different course of action. Even though our body is telling us, no, I badly need these cigarettes, you know, to keep myself functional and keep me alive and keep me enjoying my life. And the doctor is saying, no, no, but if you do that, you're going to die. And so we go, no, in our mind we go, well, it's not logical for me to die because I can't then use my body to do other things that I actually like if I'm dead. So I need to change my way. So I change my way in that particular direction, in that particular thing. So I don't give up food still or other things that are damaging me and I don't say all food's damaging them and just the food that does damage you I'm not giving up that yet because it's the smoking that's killing me but then let's say after we give up smoking we start eating a lot more generally that's the case isn't it when you give up cigarettes and you start eating a lot more and now I'm starting to whack on the weight so I go back to the doctor and the doctor says you've just now substituted food <laughs> cigarettes with food and if you keep going the way you're going you're going to be so obese you're going to get heart disease and you're, and you're going to take 10 or 15 years off your life usually that's the case at least and so now that he's triggered another part of our fear well you know I can't get my other needs met with this body if I continue to eat too much so now I've got to go on a diet right so I now start being selective, so my mind now starts selecting what I eat in order to promote some longevity, in order to live a bit longer so that I can enjoy my body a bit more. That's the reason generally why we finish up doing it. So now our mind has overcome the brute with regard to its, deny, its desire for certain types of foods. The mind saying, no, you're not allowed to have that food. You're not allowed. This is why it's so hard, you know, because you, your mind says that and you get nice and slim again and then you go off your diet. And because the soul's unhealed emotional reasons as to why it wants those things are still happening and the physical body is just responding to that soul unhealed emotion, so therefore the physical body has its own desires, it needs that serotonin fix that gets squirted into the brain constantly that uh, every time we eat certain types of food so it needs these chemical fixes um, and so what does it do? It demands that you eat the same foods that you gave up and so a year later you're back to the size you were again and that's why we have that term yo-yo dieting you know down up down up down up and the reason why is because the actual sole reason for it to occur hasn't been addressed and we're having to use our mind in a certain direction, force ourselves into a direction that we really, at some level, do not want to take. And this is the problem we face. 
But when our soul becomes dominant, now we would never ever, not because we wouldn't even have a feeling that we want to eat those particular foods that cause me to put on weight. You won't even like them anymore at all. You won't be attracted to them at all. You will not eat them because you don't even like them anymore. Stuff that you used to like, once you work through the different emotional reasons why you eat those particular things, you can't eat it anymore. And the body doesn't get its fix anymore that it used to get. And so you give them up completely and you never return to them. So I used to, for example, I used to like drinking wine. Who else likes drinking or liked? Yep. And I had a big collection of it and I was really into it in the sense of uh, I was pretty selective with my wines and, and I used to enjoy the taste of it more than... I never got drunk, but I used to enjoy the taste of it more than anything else. And, uh, and so I had a fairly large collection. And then once I worked through certain emotions, I would have a drink of wine and it tasted like poison. Like the same thing that I used to really enjoy the taste of before, I couldn't even smell anymore, let alone taste. Before I'd go, ah, oh, that smells good, mate. <laughs> right? And then, and then down, down with it just as if at a time generally, yeah, that tastes so good. Get out my olives and my cheese and my other things, right, <laughs> with it. And, uh, you know, if, if it was some kind of whiskey or something like that, I'd get out my strawberries and the other things with it. It was a real ritual. And, and once, we, uh, once I dealt with the emotion of it, the physical body smelt the same thing and the response was totally different. So now when I smell uh, some alcohol, it smells like turpentine to me. Now, most of you wouldn't drink turpentine unless you were a pretty hard up alcoholic, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I'd smell, oh, ooh, you know, that doesn't smell any good. It smells more like somebody needs to light and put a match to it than it does to go in my own body. And, and so there's, there's not a physical decision that I made, not an intellectual decision to give up drinking. It wasn't an intellectual choice at all. My body was just saying to me, I don't want this anymore. So the body was now no longer desiring the same things. The animal no longer even had the same desires that it had before. And this is where, when we're soul dominant, we start to realise that actually the soul, this soul, does actually at some level control everything else. And this animal is actually controlled by the soul and its emotions and its feelings. And the spirit body's mind can actually be controlled and the spirit body itself can also be controlled by this soul as well. And that's how God made you to be, to be soul dominant. The things you enjoy the most are all the things that are harmonious with that soul's growth in love and truth including the very food you eat and including the drinks you drink including everything that you do and the soul then becomes the dominant part of yourself and what we're learning to do is to go on the divine love path or let's call it what what i used to call it in the first century on the way to god's love because it's the only way so it's the way the narrow path that leads to life on that path there is only one path, God designed it, and on that path, your soul will eventually dominate everything you do in a manner that's harmonious with love and truth. That's what will happen on that path. And you will never need to fight against another negative or unloving emotion or behaviour again once you reach that condition. That's the reality of that condition. So if we can see that this self is the self that God intended to drive this self and this self, and we start to see the physical form and the spirit form as just a motor or a robot that allows the half of the soul to experience itself. That's all it does. These are just input devices 
for the half of the soul to receive an experience. That's all they are, just a, an input device. And once we see these things as input devices and, be, and start to allow the soul to dominate, then we make a lot of changes and we, we're capable of actually making changes very rapidly without fighting them and without them being hugely painful. What causes most of our pain, in fact, is the brain and the mind fighting against the desire for the soul to be dominant. In other words, the brain and the mind want dominance. And that's what causes the majority of our pain, both physical pain and other forms of pain, emotional pain and so forth, is our desire for these things to dominate the soul. And we taught, we taught ourselves, or it would be best saying, other people have taught us from a very young age that our soul needs to be subservient to their mind. And in fact, for the majority of us, our childhood is this, our soul being made subservient to the mind of our parents. And so after, by the time we become, you know, seven, eight years of age, we are so used to being subservient to the mind of our parents that the only areas of our soul that we connect to are the areas of our soul that our parents thought were allowable. They're the only areas we connect to by that age, generally. And what we're attempting to do is to reverse that reverse that process, which feels, as Graham mentioned earlier, feels like it's a regression almost, initially. Yeah. yeah. Is there any questions about that process, Antonix? So AJ, is that the true nature of evolution? The soul development is actually your evolution with God? Yes. Through your experiences of the two bodies? Yes, um, if we look at history, God created the animal part of ourselves first and there was a time where people were on earth but they weren't self-reliant, they weren't, they weren't self-determinate. They were people, they had a body, a physical form and they had a spirit body, a, a spiritual form but they were like animals in the sense they were exactly the same as animals are today in that there is no soul attachment to an animal. And then God created the human soul and in that process of creating the human soul attached the first soul of the first couple attached it on, on this earth, attached it to a physical body that, he, that God had created for it through this other process, but the animal process that goes on right in front of your face every day when we see animals reproducing over and over again. There was this animal which was a physical form, the highest, had, a, had the biggest brain capacity of all the animals. God created it purposefully in that direction. And God created it purposely to stand upright like we currently do, but, um, and created it in perfect form. Then God attached the very first couple to their individual bodies. The soul of the very first couple was attached to those bodies. And, and if you talk to that first human couple, Ammon and Amman, they were never born, they, they were never born like a baby, but they, their, first, their very first memory was waking up in the body of a fully grown adult body. That's their very first memory. Uh, and they have no idea, we can only postulate what I'm saying about what happened before then, they had no idea how that body came to be. They had no parent. They had no physical parent that they could identify, but they were different to, to every other person. So did God intend then that every person would grow to at one moment with a physical body and spirit body attached? So uh, that was totally capable of doing so, yeah. So no one has to die. Yeah. Yeah, totally capable of doing so. So we are totally capable of actually being in that place. God, so God created the physical form and the spirit form of the first human couple with the, with the ability for it to replicate and everything else. God created those particular things as far as we know because nobody knew what was before then. And, and then when the very first souls were incarnated into those bodies, they woke up as an adult alive 
and with self-awareness. Um, but no other beings were present, no other, you know, so there wasn't a chain of parents or children or any of those kind of things in front of them um, to identify with. They would just woke up with that awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, AJ. You've won me over here. I'm really curious what they did the next day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there was no shops, there was no physical temptations of the lower realms that we're currently in condition with. Do, have, obviously you talked to them about that. How was their next day? Did it go well? <laughs> of course it went well. Um, have you ever seen uh, the TV series, what was it called? Babe, that one where that young fellow without a belly button. Kyle X. Kyle X. Y. Have you ever seen that? It's a TV series, Kyle X. Y. I think it's called. No? It's very interesting because it, actually he came into existence. I won't give you much of a background because otherwise the f whole first... The whole first year of it will not need to be watched if I give you too much. But, <laughs> um, but he came into existence somehow. And I, and I, do you want to know how? Or do you want to watch the TV show? That's all. Are you going to get a chance? I don't know. I, I, I've got the first box set at home if you want to see it. Um, no, what, what happens is he came into existence without a conscious recollection of anything before he came into existence, as in, a, in an adult body, like about a 17 or an 18 year old body. And, um, and what would you do with that if it was you? Wouldn't you just begin the process of experimenting? Discovery and things. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what the first human couple did. So the first human couple spent a fair portion of their first part of their life just experimenting, learning, just discovering and learning, yeah. And without having a parent, so therefore without having any emotional imprint of any injuries or anything like that. Yeah. Um, Zachary Stitchin's view of what you mentioned with the Nephilim taking bones and bits and pieces of aliens and impregnated it into a, a pro-magnum man is that just our mind making up a story because, like you said before, Amon and Amin didn't have a memory of how they got into the body? And we um, just... No, the Nephilim is a, a, a totally different thing altogether. Um, do you want me to explain what it is? Yes, please. For those yes. of you who... In the, for those of you, have you ever heard of the Nephilim for the majority of you? In the Bible, it talks about... Uh, on, before the days of Noah, it says in the book of Genesis, that there were people who roamed the earth who were much larger than the average person and that they couldn't have children. Um, they were the progeny of what the Bible says were a mixture of spirits and people on earth. They were the progeny of... Um, well, what a lot of other people feel are aliens, basically mixed racing with people on Earth, but the progeny being like a mule. Uh, in other words, unable to have further children. But the progeny were twice the height and twice the skull size of the average human on Earth today. So they were around about 10 to 12 feet tall, and they had these very, very large skulls, and they very, uh, according to the Bible, um, it doesn't say those other things, but the Bible actually says that they were quite violent people as a result of their size, which, which is actually, and these, uh, these records or historical records are available in a lot of different teachings, not just in the Bible. So, and whenever anything's available in a lot of different areas, there are obvious certain truths available in those particular things and this is what happened what happened was man after the um, Ammon and a man the first human couple were living on earth remember they began in a, with a good soul condition 
and their bodies were perfect, far better than actually all of our bodies uh, in terms of the perfection of their bodies. And in fact, if you looked at them, their body was symmetrical on each side of their body. And if you look at your own face, if you ever put a mirror sort of on one side and one side, you'll find that for the majority of us, we have a lot of insymmetrical uh, face. So you almost look like a completely different person on one side compared to the other side normally, right? But for them, they were perfectly symmetrical. Every single organ in their body, in their body worked perfectly and, um, and was completely functional. They were in a six-sphere condition on Earth, so everything worked perfectly in their body. They were not ageing at this particular time. So in other words, their body maintained the age around about which they were created and uh, in terms of its physical form and it didn't change until an event and the event was their desire to be self-reliant and once they went into self-reliance let's, let's spell that let's see here once they went into that desire for self-reliance, they then began taking actions which caused the degradation of their own soul, which then caused the degradation of their spirit body and their physical body. Does that make sense? So over a period of now, some quite a few thousand, uh, tens of thousands of years, because the degradation of the soul kept continuing through generation after generation after generation, we ended up with a very, very animal-like body. Still the two genders, but uh, they didn't really wear clothes. So um, they, were, they, were, they were very decrepit. Um, by the way, the first human couple lived almost a thousand years. This couple, on the average, lived less than 20 years. So that's how much degradation of the soul had occurred. And then um, after all of these people passed, of course, they all went up into the spirit world and they had a more of a more of an influence on the spiritual side of man. And so from that degradation, mankind began to grow again and started to grow and progress. Now remember we started in this sixth dimensional condition and eventually we went through five, four, three, three, four, one, two, three, and then down into the hells. This was a hellish condition in all ways, including living on earth was hellish. And then man started to grow in condition again. And by the time men got to the second dimension in their condition, in their growth, which actually did occur on the average, then spirits, some of these spirits from the past, could actually materialise a human form, which they did do, because the environment to do so was consistent enough for them to maintain their form for long periods of time. So they materialised a human form, and some of them materialised a human form long enough for them to take wives, well, I wouldn't call it taking wives. A lot of them actually, unfortunately, just had sex with as many of the women they possibly could. And as a result of that, they had a, a creature, you could say, which also was a human, um, it had, a, had, had a human form, um, in the, but was twice the size of the people around at the time and in fact almost twice the size that we are today and they through these were quite negative emotions driving these people in other words when I say negative emotions they were emotions that were driven by selfishness basically and as a result these people here became dominant because of their physical size Domin because of their physical size, they would dominate everyone. Now, it was the intelligence around at that time were all created by these people. So you know the Great Pyramid? That was designed and built by those people. 
And by the way, they didn't use the tools that everybody thinks they used. Um, they used all of the knowledge that they had gained over thousands of years in the spirit world um, with the way that we used energy. Um, and they could uh, use energy in lots of different ways. You know how we use light energy today in lasers, with lasers? Well, they could use energy in a similar form, but with more powerfully so. And they could levitate as well. Uh, things so they levitated the rocks all of the rocks of the great pyramid into position through the energy that they had and um, but but while they were living on earth their condition continued to degrade and then there were some cataclysmic events that occurred on the earth because of the condition of them degrading so man started to degrade again as a result of their condition and because of the violence there were some cataclysms that occurred on the earth so let's just draw those, so, which the Bible calls the flood of Noah's day. Right? But they are actually cataclysms that are actually being faced by us today as well, similar type of world-based cataclysms. These spirits dematerialized their body and went back to the spirit world. These people who were these brute animal people who were basically dominated by their brute force they died and are now in the spirit world as well does that make sense and uh, but they're in the hells of the spirit world because of their actions that they took and then after that man started to improve in his condition again which is where we're headed now yeah so does that make sense what's happened historically now the only way you can find out this information well there, there is a there is information available um, in on the earth to prove a lot of this material so in other words there have been the skulls of these particular people found that are twice the size or almost twice the size of a normal human skull and quite elongated and the size of their skeletons are much much higher um, and so there is a fossil record that these people existed on the earth in the past. And there was also the record of what these people, who have obviously had quite developed intellects, could, could do. And many of the pyramids around the earth that are built, not the ones in Egypt I'm talking about now, but around the earth, are built in certain locations of the earth where there are crustal movements that where different continents rise and fall generally over cyclical periods and these particular places were built in st relatively stable areas so that they would last for tens of thousands of years rather than just lasting for hundreds of years like many of our constructions well our constructions now even our concrete constructions only last a few hundred years if they're left un unmaintained and so these people here were, did have a visit to the earth again in a materialised form. From that point in time, the earth has not been in the condition where anybody can materialise a body, aside from celestial spirits, where anybody else can materialise a body for a long enough time to maintain that form. And, and also there have been limitations placed on it in terms of uh, through the different degradation in condition some of the limitations include not not actually being able to um, procreate while they're in that form so for that reason you don't see these procreations happening again is there any questions about, about those you want to continue eagle yeah this brings up a very interesting question if uh, in the future, spirit can materialize and have a baby on earth. Does that mean that human extinction is not possible? Um, well, firstly, remember if a spirit materializes a body and then has uh, sex with a, with a person on earth, a woman on earth, or vice versa, um, the progeny is like, uh, it has no further genetic development, so therefore cannot have children. So, so so our life extending on earth in terms of the human race is dependent upon humans having children with other humans not on spirits materializing yeah, a form. so it's in our best interest to look after each other basically yeah, of course yeah. <laughs> of course um, the 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 issue faced by these spirits is they were driven by some fairly uh, strong emotions where um, once 
the human race got to a condition they were driven by sexual emotions actually once the human race got to a certain condition the women on the earth started looking good again there was a long period of time where women and men looked very similar in a lot of ways and also um, were quite animalistic in nature and so most of the spirits wouldn't demonstrate any interest towards a woman on earth but once they got to a certain development, um, the spirits felt quite interested in them sexually again. And so this is why they attempted to do a materialisation of a spirit form. And also to gain power. It was a lot about power. Um, so because the condition of the earth, or the spiritual condition of the earth at the time, was in a second dimension, it was higher condition than we currently are, um, these people could materialise a form and maintain it for a, long, for a period of time. And uh, one more. Um, so we came close, you, you said it before, we came close in this century of total annihilation, human an an annihilation, with the nuclear bombs and... Certainly, yeah. So if we did annihilate, um, all these uh, souls that not incarnated yet, would never have a chance to incarnate or they will have a chance in other Earths? Well, they've always got the chance in other Earths to incarnate. So um, they don't necessarily have to come to this Earth to incarnate. So if something happened to this particular Earth, then whatever ha was happening to the other Earths may not occur in the same manner as to this Earth. And so there's always a chance for a soul generally to incarnate. That's good news. Yeah. Right, thank you. And if we go to Carol, and then back to Elizabeth. AJ, if, if somebody gets to a second sphere, say, in this lifetime, is it possible then to attract somebody in that really low state again? Like, how come those low, lower people could meet up with somebody in the second sphere? It's not these lower people, it's the people in the spirit world. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Not people on Earth. And the people in the, on Earth were in the second sphere condition. And the people on Earth, in the spirit world were in a second sphere or higher condition as well. Okay. But the problem is they're all on the natural love path. So in other words, there was a lot of emotions that they still had unhealed within them that they could act upon. And for many of them, um, there was a lot of sexual emotions that they could act upon if they wanted to. And so they took the opportunity to materialise and then act upon those emotions. In the process, degrading their own condition. When you're in the spirit world, you can degrade your condition as much as you can when you're on Earth. And in fact, many people degrade their condition even faster than they do on Earth in the spirit world when they arrive. Because they have this uh, feeling of freedom which they did not have on the Earth, freedom to do whatever they want. And as a result of their feeling of freedom when they pass into the spirit world, they often do things that they wouldn't have done on Earth because there is this restriction of law on Earth that exists. Because of the moral development of mankind, we now have laws on Earth that prevent us from taking certain actions sometimes that we'd like to take. So, so for example, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us at times would have had so much rage in us where we would have liked to have killed somebody, for example, if we're honest with ourselves. But because there was a law against it and the potential of being put in jail and so forth, uh, we often didn't take the action. And so therefore we didn't degrade our soul condition with the choice of killing somebody, even though we were angry enough to do so. But when we pass into the spirit world, there's seemingly no law, there's no man law anyway in the spirit world that prevents you from murdering. And as a result of that, if you still have a murderous feeling in your soul, you'll want to create the murder of another person. And you'll do whatever you can do, including attaching yourself to a person on earth, if need be, to try and manipulate them in order to murder somebody else. And many people who murder on earth are, are under the control of people who have passed in the spirit world who want to murder people and who never murdered people while they were in the, on earth the first time, but they chose to once they'd passed through the influencing the actions of another. And so the reality is we can degrade in our condition in the spirit world and it happens far more regularly than the majority of you believe at this point. Right? The, rea the reality is the majority of people when they first arrive in the spirit world usually degrade their condition further before 
they finish up taking any positive action to, to grow their soul. So if we, is this likely to happen again? Like if we have earth changes and then there's pockets of us that actually follow this path and suddenly somebody materialises, so we've got to check them out first? <laughs> well, down the track down here, if we keep drawing this map, there was an event that occurred, which was 2,000 years ago, which was somebody discovered divine love and how to receive it into the soul. Does that make sense? Now, at that point in time, the likelihood now of the whole of humanity degrading its condition further became quite remote because, because there was now the ability to receive divine love from God and actually transform the soul into the creature that God designed it originally to be. And as a result of that discovery, if you like, the chances of future people materialising bodies on earth just for the purpose of damaging people on earth are quite highly unlikely to occur um, just because of the presence of love now on earth and has been on earth, the presence of God's love on earth has been since 2,000 years ago. Um, and that presence of God's love on earth is part of our natural evolutionary development, if you like, as a human race. And as a result of that love being present on earth in some form since that time, the likelihood of large numbers or even small numbers of people doing this again are, are pretty remote due to the effects of the love and what the love does to the soul. So while it's possible that in future times people, spirits will materialise bodies, and in fact in your lifetime my feeling is that there will be many spirits who you'll be able to speak to who materialise a body just for the purpose of speaking to you at some point in the future, it's highly unlikely that they'll want to have sex with you or, and, and produce progeny because you know, the reality is they've seen the results of it the previous time and therefore can see that it's an unloving action that they'd be taking. Yeah. And also, AJ, did you say that there was, um, there was people on Earth before, a mon and a man? And if so, did they reproduce like, you know, like, yeah, were they around before that? A mon and a man don't remember any. Um, so, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to explain. You know, like, for example, a mon and a man, when they first incarnated, incarnated into a specific location on Earth. In that particular location where they incarnated and, the, and where they spent most of their life, they experimented a lot in their life but, and went to different places, but in that particular location, they didn't ever see another human couple. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that another humanoid form exist, didn't exist on the planet. It just means they never saw them. And therefore, uh, and, and my personal feelings are that there wasn't any, is my personal feelings, but, uh, but that's only through my communication with God that I've learned that, not through discussing it through some other means. Um, so my feelings were that there were no humans ready for the incarnation of the soul except these particular two. These particular two were ready for that. Now, in terms of human forms, we don't really know whether they existed elsewhere on the planet uh, or even, for that matter, in other planets at the same time because nobody's uh, investigated that fully and you can't investigate that fully until you're in the soul world. So th there's all this information locked up in myself that as I deal with different things that, that, I, that I remember and as I remember them, I'll tell you, but that's all I remember at this point. Because you said that they knew they were different. Is that like different to other animals? Is that what? You mean? Yeah, the the same process as they went through uh, with other. Uh, you know, they, the bodies that were capable. The two bodies were capable of the same process of, of any other animal process. Um, however, whether they existed, I, I'm uncertain. Yeah, and and so are pretty much any spirit because we don't know because the first people it happened to just remember waking up in a completed form and their soulmate being next to them in a completed form and, uh, and not understanding how they got there at this point but then going through a process of discovery. Yeah. And, and did uh, a man and a man, like, did they know that they were pulling away? Did they know what they were pulling away from? Did they yes. have a clear idea of what was going on? Yes, 
Yeah, they spent a time in the sixth sphere, basically, uh, and God's love was available to them actually at that point as well. So God had actually tried to teach them through some processes. Not, it's not the way, it's not a verbal teaching, but it, it's through some processes that God also took me through in the first century to try to teach me that the divine love was available. And the same thing that they went through, they were try, they, he attempted to teach them that, God, that his love was available. But they actually made a conscious decision that they didn't want God. They knew God existed completely. They understood God's existence and knew God existed. They knew that this love was available, but they decided that they wanted to be God themselves. So they actually believed that they were capable individually. And when you talk to them, I know it sounds arrogant now if you think about it, but, but when you talk to them, they have a lot of intellectual reasonings and arguments as to why they thought that would be possible. And, um, and they decided to act upon that desire. So they made a purposeful choice to reject God's love and a purposeful choice instead to have a desire for self-reliance. And they actually made that choice in an effort to be God. And I find it very interesting that many New Age religions today call us God when the reality is the very first degradation of the human soul was caused by exactly the same emotion. But if you talk to them, you'll, you'll be able to find out their reasons. They've, they, they weren't um, in the Paget messages. They, they only had a few messages in the Paget messages. They do explain some of it, like that it was a conscious choice and a conscious decision that they made. And they do explain that it was a desire that they had from within themselves to be self-reliant and that they knew God existed and they knew that God's love was available, but they rejected that love. So they do explain all of that, um, but, they, but they don't go into, and they couldn't through Paget go into many of the reasons why they had that particular feeling. But they would have had a lot of other humans then, like they would have had their children and their children and all that. So they would have all had to have made that decision at that point, because well, the, otherwise there would have been somebody else. That, they actually made the decision before they had children. And so that meant that the emotions inside of them got imposed upon the next generation of children. And, um, and as a result of that, the next generation of children had the same emotion, which of course they believed fully they should retain rather than eradicate from within themselves. And as a result of that, the degradation continued. And so, yeah, and so the age of the people also degraded during this time. Yep. Can we just ask Mary? I'll just come here because <laughs> I'm on that camera. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that, just an observation, um, everyone always looks so mystified about Amon and a man's choices. I always feel everyone go, why would they do that? What, if there's God, why would you do that? But really... Um, We're making the same choice every day. That's exactly my next sentence. Yeah. And I've... <laughs> Funny how you Funny do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel we all we all know about God. We all know about God's love, and we make the same choice every day. And I have, you know, in my past few weeks, really felt the emo that emotion within me that God, I'm not going to accept who you made me. I'm going to make me <laughs> how I want to be me. Mm. And that is the choice that a man and a man made. Instead of submitting to this beautiful soul, they went. I don't want that soul, I want to make myself something different. And I see that we all do that. So mm. it, just, it was just an observation because everyone was like, oh, crazy, why did they do it? But also we want to make ourselves something different because our parents wanted to make us something different and we are very, very hooked into what our parents wanted. So, so we have, and Amon and a man's children were the same, of course. So the, the Mon and a man's children automatically fell into that same desire of wanting to be a bit different to what they actually were to suit the parents' choices and decisions. It's exactly the same choice. Yeah, thanks, mate. Elizabeth, we were next. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to change the subject quite. Um, How, can I ask whether we've exhausted this subject before you begin? Can you hold your thought then, Elizabeth, yeah. and let's anybody on this subject still asking questions, I want to finish this subject off, if we can do that. So can we go? Louise? 
Yeah, Louise, and then Deb, and then oh, back there, far away. Um, well, I feel it's on the subject. It's just with me personally in my relationship with God. Um, I just want to ask you, I don't seem to want to emotionally connect with God. I've tried, and it's always intellectual, and I haven't been, I feel, successful. So I don't feel I'm like a mon and a man, that I want to be God, but I'm just wondering... Is it still my gender-based injuries that I'm not wanting to connect with All God right, I'll ask that question. I'll answer that question later. So we're asking, why don't I want to connect to God? Why don't I connect to God? Even when I want to. <laughs> That's how you feel? You feel like you want to? Let's leave that for another time. In a minute, it's, uh, it's, I want, still on this subject, the degradation of man, those kind of subjects. If we come down, to, oh, sorry, let's go to Linda. Linda, the mic's up, then, Linda. So let's stay there. And on this side, who had your hand up? That side. Can we go across to Graham? On this side, far away, Linda. Hey, um, just wondering, um, are there any ex cavemen that are in the celestial heavens? Yes. <laughs> That's yes, there awesome. are. Um, how did they? get that help from that really animalistic? Uh, it was very difficult and took a lot of thousands of years, but uh, in time they felt through their emotions. Because, because they, um, they didn't have a highly developed intellect guiding their behaviour and it actually helped them in some ways to actually feel through the emotion and release the emotion once they were in the spirit world. So there's some that didn't know, because they didn't have a highly developed intellect, they didn't know how, or even that they could, harm people on earth. So when they passed over, they stopped harming everybody, right? And they, their condition was fixed for a certain time. And then through the influence of some brighter spirits, they were encouraged through some emotional impressions to actually just feel their emotions. And because they didn't have a highly developed intellect, they allowed themselves to feel their emotions more readily, in fact, uh, than what they might have done in, their, in a similar condition if they had a more highly developed intellect. And as a result, there are so-called cavemen now who are in the celestial heavens. They don't look like cavemen anymore. But they, um, they actually, some of them have actually developed faster than people before them developed. And uh, because the people before them, before them here had a highly developed intellect and therefore were very resistive through the intellect of their soul condition, whereas the people here were less so. So a, a, a fair majority of these ones here have actually found uh, the divine love path as a result, whereas the fair majority of these ones here have not. Yeah, which is interesting in itself, eh? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. No worries. Um, Graham? Um, the Urantia book says that the first, what we call the first humans, were actually um, a, a further mutation of the human genome, if you like. Mm -hmm. And because they saw themselves as different from everybody else, they, they, went, they went away from everybody else. And I think it was after that that the, um, what the Urantia book calls the thought adjuster came into them when what we might call the soul yeah and so would that be uh, potentially possible potentially possible the problem with the Urantia book is that it presents a lot of things potentially possible as facts without there being um, anybody who can verify those particular facts there is a there is some potential verification in certain fossil records that you can discover on earth and so forth but that doesn't make it a fact um, so it is certainly possible that the first human couple's bodies were actually produced um, in that slow development, evolutionary development cycle, um, and they were basically animals until the soul was added to the body. And, uh, and that, but the first human couple just remember that process. They remember they woke up self-aware and realised that, that there was no beings around them that were self-aware. And for, so they, they became the first self-aware beings on the planet. 
and uh, and from then on every other being that was their progeny was also self-aware so it wasn't a mis it wasn't sort of a one-off occurrence where all of a sudden two happened and they were self-aware and then from then on there was no self-awareness again for a period of time it wasn't like that it was that every one of their children were also self-aware and could it also be in a, their perspective from that self-aware state on the other proto-humans, if we call it, they would have just perceived them like we see apes animals. And, yeah, and like we like see that. animals. Yeah, that's yeah. possible. Um, you know, but that's not what they describe when you talk to them. So you know, it's, uh, so it's a possibility without it being a probability. I feel because when you talk to Ammon and a man, they never saw those proto-humans. Uh, in their own lives or development. Uh, now, it's possible that they weren't around where they were. It's possible. Um, but as to why that would be the case, you know, we can only postulate. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the problem is when you speak with them that they only have their memories to go on, just like we have ours to go on, and we can only remember what we can only remember. And there were no spirits in the spirit world who were observing these particular events in order to get information. So for, for many of us, when you go to the spirit world and you want to know what happened before your birth, like, you know, 10 years before your birth, it's relatively easy to find out. All you've got to do is find people who, you know, lived in a similar location to where before you were born, where you did before you were born, and, and then ask them questions about what happened and they can show you pictures of what they saw and, and all sorts of things. It's like you, they can show you videos, they can relate to you what you saw, tell you their emotions even and, and actually project even the emotion at you so you can feel it. So, so you can find out a lot of what happened before you were born. You can even find out a lot of what happened in your own family before you were born by using these methods of an impartial observer on your family. But for the first human couple that's very hard because there was no one uh, who was self-aware before that time in the spirit world where they live and, or on earth and as a result of that they have no way of discovering that before what ha occurred before they became self-aware. There are ways of discovering it scientifically which they've exhausted um, uh, but, but none of them from my discussions with them until I left the spirit world uh, were conclusive in terms of what they decided upon as the actual fact and there's no way to determine the actual fact without connecting to God and asking God on the subject and determining it that way. And just an, another question, um, that false start there where you, uh, you've got the giants and things, um, like it would have been all over the planet because there would have been collective human um, stuff so there might have been slightly different things happening elsewhere like in India the the Vedic times and then there would have been Atlantis and Lemuria would that have all been happening about the same sort of time? Yeah these events where the giants were on earth all happened at a very similar time period over a few thousand years and um, so it was a very similar time period before the cataclysmic events of the earth caught up with it and these the, the progeny of these could not be replicated, so they, so they couldn't have children. And these could only have sex with a certain number of people before they passed back into the spirit world, before they dematerialised their body back into the spirit world. And they couldn't come back after that, because so, they couldn't maintain their bodies because of their degradation of their own condition. So once they maintained their body for a certain period of time, their own condition began degrading which meant that they could no longer maintain their body and they had to go back to the spirit world. As a result of that, there's only a certain number of children that they had with women or men that were on earth. And as a result of that, and it was my, primarily, by the way, the women who were on earth and the men who came from the spirit world. Um, and there's some reasons for that, in that, in that a, a, a woman who materialises a body on earth is not uh, capable of actually having a child. Uh, on earth, of not, ha not capable of conceiving and having a child with the spirit uh, materialised body that they have. So it was the men having children uh, with women who were earthly women and then of course those men passed back to the spirit world and as a result of that the children of those couples only lived one generation and then died off.
Yeah. So it was a very short period. It happened over thousands of years, where it happened in different places over thousands of years, but it was a very short period of time that these people lived on Earth. So the blue-skinned people that are in Indian mythology, would they have been the materialised spirits? Um, I, I assume so. I haven't questioned the spirits who were available at that time to tell me, but I assume that this... Uh, that I, I have questioned quite a lot of spirits about this particular thing when I was in the spirit world, and in every case there was a materialisation of a spirit form. And um, they purposefully displayed themselves to be a little different than humans in order to um, trigger the fear of humans and in order then to... to um, automatically be able to control people. They also had their spirit mind fully functional, so they had the ability of uh, lots of mathematical and scientific things that men couldn't do at the time, which caused the men, men and women at the time to believe they were gods, and that caused the men and women at the time to want to serve these gods, to want to give them power, and uh, as a result, um, the average man and woman on the earth gave them their power because they believed them to be gods. Um, but they were just materialised spirits, yeah. So that would be the Greek gods as well, would it? Um, no, the Greek gods are a little different in that the Greek gods are people who used to live on earth um, who were, and this happens all the time, people on earth are often assigned mythological uh, significance once they pass. The same things happened to myself, in fact, um, and my mother. So, for example, um, people on earth wanted to believe that my mother was a virgin before she gave birth to me and that she got pregnant by God because, because there was this mythology that if a per the only person who could ever become at one with God or be a developed person on earth was a person who came from God and who had, had not had, you know, whose mother had not had sex. And because uh, there was this also this viewpoint that sex is degrading to the spiritual condition of a person. And because of these merging belief systems, it's then implicated that my mother was a virgin uh, and she became impregnated by God. Now that is a myth. Uh, but, it, it, but it obtained mythical significance through the desires and emotions of people on earth and eventually people taught it as reality. And this is what's happened to the Greek gods as well. They were actually people who lived on Earth. And we've actually talked to many of them recently when we were in Greece. And in fact, one of the reasons why we received a lot of anger while we were in Greece was because these gods, who were actually first fear spirits still, um, who had maintained a large uh, control over different people who we'd been speaking to, no longer had that control. And uh, so they became very angry and upset with myself and Mary for speaking to the people who they were controlling. So they are very different. They are a group of spirits who used to live on Earth, who had this mythical status based on the influence they would put upon other people from the spirit world. And uh, they are still, and many of them, the majority of them, in fact, still in the first sphere of the spirit world, still having the same mythical uh, influence upon people. They lie all the time about what they were and what they did and all those kind of things to people on earth and then people on earth wrote all of this down of course and then it became fact as if it was ever fact yep. Yep. thank you yep um thanks linda oh sorry deb we're going to come down to deb as well thanks linda oh i'm just curious how many children did a mon and a man have and over what period of time um well, there are some records in the Bible that are retained that indicate that uh, Ammon and a man had, had at least six children. Um, my feeling uh, from, and I, I, haven't, I can't remember my, some, all of my conversations with them yet, but uh, um, my feeling is they, they, they had over 35 children in the course of their lifetime. Um, they c could, to a degree, though, control pregnancy based on based on their desire. So they weren't. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Amon wasn't always pregnant. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So, like, she wouldn't have had those thirty-five children in the first one hundred years, given that no. they've lived for a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was over the period of time. Yeah. Um, the Bible, I think, says that. Uh, 
they had Cain and Abel, <laughs> um, which are more mythical again than, than, than literal children. And then it says that they became parents to sons and daughters, is, is what it says after that. Um, but it does state that Cain and Abel had a sister. And in fact, it says that, uh, they, that Abel, oh, sorry, Cain took his sister as his wife. So, so there is an indication there that, that obviously Ammon and a man had other, other children who were, who were women, obviously, and who had grew enough for them to be taken as a partner by the first two of their children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, please. Uh, I've got, I've had an ongoing... Um, upset and anger, I guess, with um, the system where, uh, you know, th th God bless them, man and man, but they, they stuffed it up. And, it, and I feel like we're, we're all in the soup together. And, yeah. And sooner or later, somebody on earth would definitely have made the choice to become self-reliant. And once they had done so, it's highly unlikely that... Um, that all of mankind would not have followed the same suit to a degree. Um, the reason why is many and well, the, some of the reasons why are many and varied, but basically um, the primary reason why is that man wanted to experience life without God, and and the reality is, that the majority of you still want to experience life without God right now. Um, because we have all sorts of reasons for that. But the majority of which are related to fear inside of us at the moment. But for a modern and a man, they were more related to self-determination. And we all have emotions of the desire for self-determination. Uh, and these emotions are not based on emotional error. They were based on desires that turn into emotional error because of how we act upon them. Sooner or later, somebody on the planet would have done that and therefore caused a series of events to occur. Now, um, my feelings are that on every planet God's ever created, the majority uh, of them have happened in a similar way, where the first couple came up with the idea um, that they would make some of those choices and decisions. Um, but I, I can't remember all the discussions I've had with those particular people, because I've only... I've only been able to have discussions with people who are in my and Mary's role in the other worlds no, because they, we met them in the, in the soul union state and that's the first time we met them. So we didn't meet them before then. So we didn't have the opportunity to discuss with anyone before then what happened in their particular, in their particular earths, if you like. Uh Oh, thank you. I just understood that my upset is why didn't I get a clean slate? And that's my upset with my mum and dad. Yeah, a lot of times we impose our emotions about what our mum and dad did to us upon God and upon what God created. And this is a, a general mistake, actually, because um, in doing so, what we do is we distance ourselves from the real emotion by projecting it at another source. So, for example, if our real emotion is one of grief and anger towards our parents for what they chose to do to us that hurt, and then we decide to not blame them, because if we blame them or, or we feel about that, we think we'll blame them, and if we feel about that, we think that the parent will not love us anymore and they won't care about us anymore. So what we do is we don't actually talk to them about the damage they've done, but instead we blame something that has no specific current effect in our life where possible. So this is where a lot of people, so that they get their blame, if you like, of, of God, of, of their parent, and because they're not willing to feel all of that, what they do is they project that blame at God, or they project that blame at somebody else who's not even related to their life, like their partner, I mean their childhood life, like their partner, and they blame that person instead. <laughs> And when we do that, we, it has the effect of distancing ourselves emotionally from the actual events that hurt us. And when we distance ourselves emotionally from events that hurt us, we will not feel them. So it gives us the control 
over being able to feel the real things that are going on in our life and the real reasons as to why we feel sad. And, and once we, the key is to stop doing that and to really focus on, no, the real reason why I feel this way is because my mum did this to me when I was a child, my father did that to me as a child and so forth. And this is the feeling I have about it now. And release that feeling rather than putting the blame to th in, onto things that are not related to your personal experience. Yeah. We distance ourselves from our personal experience so that we do not have to feel. Yeah. I'm very interested when you're ready in the other worlds with other Jesus and Marys. Yeah, yeah. They weren't called Jesus and Mary, by the way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, who else was there? Were, are still questions about this degradation or are we done with that subject? No, still not done. So, Luli, thanks. And then we'll work our way back. Um, how did God show you in the first century that divine love was available? Uh, the same way that God uh, showed Adam and, and a man, actually, and that is through, um, through this process of teaching that God has through analogy and example. And so, so I was led through from a very, very young age in the first century through a variety of experiences, which were personal experiences, where God was showing me how animals worked and how birds worked and how creatures like even insects worked and so forth. And in the process of discovering those things, I saw patterns. And every time I saw a pattern, I, I would receive from my spirit friends who were guiding me an, an acknowledgement of this pattern. And this pattern was very important. So, for example, you know, when I opened up an almond seed, for example, and I, instead of just eating it, what I would do is I used to, and I still do it actually, I used to love blanching them. You know how you put them in some hot water and take the skin off? And then if you peel them in two halves. You notice how the two halves sort of fit together to make the whole? And each half is very different to another almond. Like you'd, you, unless you've got the perfect other half, they don't go together. I don't know if you've taken much notice of those kind of things. But they're the other kind of things that basically I felt in the first century, I often felt in, you know, motivated and impelled to, to look at. And then I would ask the question, well, what's this about? Why is it like that? And in the process of asking these questions, um, I started coming to see some basic, what I felt were basic truths. So what I would do is I'd note down those basic truths, you know, intellectually note them down, and then put it into practice to see whether I was right or not. Um, and so what I would do is, it like, so I'd go, okay, that's what an arm and see is like. Let's like go and see what other things are like and often you would see this sort of this symmetrical synergy between two halves but no more than two like you know and I'd often be wondering what's going on there and then and then I would look at how animals always paired up generally and in my time in the first century most of the birds stayed pairs for life for example and uh, then I'd see how humans paired up, and I just wonder why that happens. Like, why do they keep pairing up all the time? You know. And then I then I'd realise. Then I looked at some of these other families. You know, uh, unlike my own family, uh, a lot of other families had three or four mums and one dad, and and some of them had even ten if they were rich. You know, they would have ten, twelve wives. And, and I'd look at the happiness in the family and it was very, very different to the happiness that was present in my own family. And I'd go, I wonder why that is, you know. Then, it, then it, So I started seeing how families that seemed to have mum and dad together, um, just mum and dad, no other third person, they seemed to be happier and they were more, more sort of in love, if I could use that term, then these other families, these other families seem to be set up more co for convenience. And then I experienced with, then I, then I just experimented with that in terms of, again, looking at how families were, questioning them and all those kind of things. It was the same process. And this same process was the same process God engaged for a mon and a man. 
this process of triggering them and telling, impelling them emotionally to look at different things and engage it from an emotional perspective and then and discover. And through this process, they got to see that, that God existed, that God was, had masculine and feminine qualities. They got to discover the truth of that. They also got to discover the truth of their own soul through that same process. So they understood that they were soulmates. They also got to discover that God ha obviously had love to give them through this process. Um, however, they then decided that they wanted to be the same as that God that had love to give them rather than just accept that they were children of that God. And that's where everything started to go wrong for them once they made that emotional decision. But, but it was the same process that I went through in the first century, that same process of discovery, um, which was impelled by, by God and, in my case, by the guides who were with me. Yeah. And then one day you just received some divine love and went, oh, that's divine love. Um, no, it's not sort of like that. I, um, I, I received divine love before I was conscious of receiving it. So I received it as a young child before I was intellectually aware of what was going on. There was just this feeling. It's a bit like when you're a child, you often have feelings that you don't intellectually understand. Is that not true? Where you don't have the cognizance inside of yourself to understand how that feeling came about. So what I finished up doing was I would feel this feeling at certain times and I'd go, what's going on? Like I don't understand what's going on and I wanted to understand it. So, so I decided, so, so while I was feeling divine love, I decided to experiment with that as well, to, to understand it. And in the process of understanding it, I came to understand that that was when I was open in a certain manner to God and longing to God and having this feeling, then this feeling would come to me and I started to understand the difference between a longing and not having a longing and when I didn't have the longing, the feeling didn't come. And so then I started to see that you could have the longing all the time. But it was all through this process of God teaching you through this process of experience. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Um, can we just go back? Yeah. Hi, Jay. I just want, uh, I don't understand what you just said before about the other worlds and other earths. Yeah. Where are they? Um, in the universe, the physical universe, there are other earths similar to ours with people on them similar to us. And in fact, we are actually all in a very similar state of development. Um, and the reason why we're in a very similar state of development is because God raises the potential through divine love permeating the universe and humankind can only evolve based on the potential that God raises them. There's a statement that I've made constantly in the Paget messages, if you've ever read them, and I, and I say that a river cannot rise higher than its source. And what I mean by that is this. If you imagine you have a a dam which is the source of a river, right? So there's the dam with water in it. Now while, and this is the level, so this is, so this is high up, let's say it's a thousand meters above sea level, and then it goes down, 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 down to the sea, right? So that's the sea and that's at sea level, right? The water will always flow in that direction while this is lower than that. Isn't that not a basic truth? Okay. Now, if you put, could put the sea at a higher level than this dam, what would happen now? Which way would the water flow? It would flow in the opposite direction, wouldn't it? Can you see that the river cannot ever rise higher than its source? This is why I made that statement. It's a basic statement. Now, let's apply that to God. Let's say God is the source of all of this water of truth, if you like, and we are like at sea level when we begin. So let's say that's sea level. Right? As we receive divine love, we will grow and rise to the source as we receive more and more love. But we cannot ever go higher than the source. Now, if God's love is not available, and nobody's discovered that it's available, how high is the source? 
Well, the source can only be here, the perfect man without God. That's the, or woman, when I say man, I mean humankind. That's as, the high, as high as you can go. You cannot be any more than the perfect man or woman. But if God's love gets placed into the factor, into the, into the equation, now we are capable of rising above even becoming the perfect natural man or woman because God's love can transform us to where God is potentially. So eventually, who knows, we may become like God as her children. Um, that may, I don't know how long that will take in the future. But God created a universe. So if you look at physical universe, God created many worlds where we have incarnation occurring. And every one of those children are capable of rising to the perfect natural man or woman or rising to where God is if they accept as the source of their truth God. And, uh, and all of them are capable in the same manner. Now, as God's love permeates this universe, now the potential for each of us to do this rises. So, so if God's love is, is less permeating through the universe, then the potential is not so much. But the more God's love flows into the universe, the higher the potential we have. And therefore, the higher we have the potential of evolution. So we can evolve to a higher and higher and higher condition the more we receive love, God's love and the more of God's love that is permeating the universe. So at this stage, the highest that a person can reach it, from God's love is the, the soul union state, which is that 20-second sphere condition. And that's because that's the amount of love that's currently permeating the universe and that's the highest possible potential we can reach. But God's now pumping out more love into the universe, which means that we have a potential of going to another dimension above that location, and who knows what that looks like at this point, but we have the potential of rising to that condition and so forth. And God's created that process uh, to, I believe, uh, go on for all of our life, for, for our infinite life. And, uh, and my feelings are that uh, all we need to do is understand this one basic principle. We cannot get any higher than who we choose as our source. So if I choose a perfect person as my source and not God, then the only place that I can ever get to is to be the same as that perfect person. But if I choose God as my source, now I have the ability to raise above all other source, all other potentials uh, uh, available to me once I choose God as my source of truth. Yeah. And I feel that that's happening in lots of different, and, and know that that's happening in lots of different worlds in the universe. Yeah. And it will continue to happen, and my, my feelings are eventually we may meet them in the physical. At this point in time, because they're all of a similar development, because they're all only potentially can be of a similar development, because of the amount of love that's going through the universe, um, we haven't met. But my feelings are in the future we will be able to meet once we develop ourselves as a human race and they develop themselves as, as their human race, if we can call it that. Um, once we get that development to the point where we can now in, do intergalactic travel in our physical form, if that was possible somehow, or at least in our spirit body form while we're alive in the physical, then my feelings are that we'll be able to then go back and forth. And do these people communicate on the spiritual body, like us and them as They well? have a spirit body and they have a soul and we are capable of communicating with them at the soul level and the spirit body level. And when you're in a soul union state, you can actually investigate most of these things anyway and find out the truths of them. The key is to not worry too much about things that you don't... That you, it's almost like sometimes questions are asked about things that, are far, that are far exceed our current development and then we forget our current development by becoming fascinated with those questions. 
Do, yeah. do you see? I know. <laughs> and what I'm suggesting to you is that let's take it one step at a time. Let's get our current development in place and understanding how that's going. And then a lot of these other questions can yeah. be resolved. I just get, got curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, Thanks, fine. it's always good to be cu curious. Thank you. Always. Yeah. If we go back behind you and then. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, sorry. Um, Regarding like the degradement of our soul, yep. um, I kind of feel like somehow it's kind of been put on, I don't know how this is going to come out, women somehow, like going back to <laughs> Eve and, and well... Him, his, kind of yeah, historically, unfortunately, um, a lot of men, well, actually, we've gone through cycles on the planet of blaming men and blaming women, to be frank. The current cycle we're in is blaming women, right? So in other words, there's this idea currently on Earth that if wo a woman has sex, that she's automatically a sinner. But if a man has sex, he's okay. Now, um, this comes from a lot of the unhealed emotions um, of the people who wrote down the words uh, who wanted to blame women for being what they call misled from spirituality through sex. And the reason why it happened was years ago, and I'm talking now many, like tens of thousands of years ago, women were actually dominating men. And the way in which they dominated men was through sex. They actually had these sort of sexual goddess type viewpoints of themselves and they believed that they could then have sex with lots and lots of different partners and, um, and they would engage sexually with lots of different partners. And a lot of the men uh, became very sad uh, and then very angry about that. And then as a result of that, the men began using their physical strength violently towards women and perpetrated a, re a, re a reversal, if you like, on the planet. So what happened at one point was here, the women were very dominant on Earth and there are actual records, again, uh, a lot of them now are more mystical records than otherwise, um, of this being the case. And then we went, we, we don't ever seem to swing to balance. That's usually not, ha not happening. So what happens is men, women were dominant, then men became dominant. And of course, one way men retain dominance is by blaming the women for their do dominance. Does that make sense? It's a bit like political parties today. How does one political party get in power? They blame the other party for all the things they did wrong and eventually all the list of things that they did wrong becomes so long that everybody decides to vote in the new party knowing full well that the new party will probably do everything the same as well. But it's just an excuse we use to get rid of the old and bring in the new. And so what finishes up happening is we swing between it again and swing between it again and this is what's happened historically and hopefully every swing brings us closer to balance. So, for the, so every time the swing has occurred Generally, there's been a, a bit of a drawing closer to what is the truth. The truth is that men and women are equal, obviously, that is the truth. But this balance is often a way of correction of, of previous error. So what happens in a lot of holy books now is that women are blamed. And the reality is if you talk to a mon and a man, they actually both made the decision together and the decision was not made based on sex, anything to do with sex at all, right? So, so the reality is it had nothing, the decision had nothing to do with gender, but had everything to do with choice about wanting self-reliance. So then how did the... Um, uh, um, how did men end up being the dominant... I don't know, how did that decision kind of... I'm still unsure about how the decision got made that men ended up being controlling over women. Do you... 
Yeah, uh, well, you... men's bodies by nature are larger than women's generally. Um, and as a result of their bodies being larger, they generally have more physical force available to them. And as the degradation of mankind occurred, the physical force became more dominant as a result. So the more the degradation of mankind be became prominent, the more the physical force of the animal nature of a person became the dominating factor in all decisions. So eventually it got to the point where the strongest, the physical, physically strongest, prevailed over the weakest. And whereas when Amon and Amen were first created, although their bodies were of a similar height, but, uh, but the female body was, was weaker in physically than the males, because it's made differently, obviously. So it was weaker in terms of a physical, its physical strength. It had, obviously, different purposes available to it. And by the way, when our soul con completely de controls our physical body, our physical body actually, it's immaterial how strong it is. It's actually the soul strength that determines how strong the physical body is. So as we disconnect from the soul further and further, the physicalness of the bodies are what takes over the dominating factor. And so as the degradation of mankind occurred, the physical nature become more and more and more dominant, which means the male part or the male body became more dominant. And then men could dominate women as a result of that. Does that make sense? When men and women are completely connected to their soul, besides the fact that they wouldn't do anything that was unloving, the secondary issue is that when you're in that place, your body is just as strong as any other person's body. Uh, because your strength of your body is determined by your soul's connection to the body and not to the body itself. This is why historically people who have been in situations that are stressful have been able to do things like lift cars for example off of people because in some moments of time we have times when just our soul is connected to our body and our body is capable of far more strength and far more activity and, and far more things than what our body currently is. So you know how currently, if you got on top of, say, a 30-foot high building and decided just to jump off, right, without anything attached to you, and most of us would be quite frightened of doing that if we're jumping into the ground. Most of us would be quite stressed about that, wouldn't we? Right. There's a high likelihood of something breaking when we hit the ground, right? Well, in the future, people will be able to do things like that and survive, not only survive, it will just be like a daily activity. Does that make sense? Because of the connection of the soul to the body and what the body then becomes capable of. Thank you. Mm. If we go, Krista. Hi, AJ. <coughs> um, just with what you said there, so with our physical strength, we'll kind of be like superheroes. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Yep. Um. <laughs> but remember, it's dependent upon the soul's growth in love. <laughs> okay. Um, and men and women will have the same physical strength? Have a similar physical strength because it, the strength doesn't come from the physical form but rather from the soul's strength. So when a man and a woman are both at one with God, they'll pretty much be the same physical strength? Yes, they might be different heights still and the body construction will be different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the woman's body is capable of carrying a child whereas the man's isn't and so forth. So they've got different roles uh, just through, through the construction of the body being different. However, the strength in the body will be very similar. Okay. Um, and the next question I feel a bit stupid asking, but um, is Amun... <laughs> Amon and um, the other one, is that Adam and Eve? Yeah, well, it's what people call a a Adam and Eve, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and my other question was, so technically, because they were like the first people to um, get a soul attached to them. So when they had children, or the children, like, did the brother and sisters like get together or did the children get with an animal one? No, the brothers and sisters grew up 
and became adults and then they fell in love with their brother or sister and and basically they had children after that. So technically we are all brother and sister. Technically we are all brothers and sisters, yes. <laughs> Both our physical in our physical form and in our spirit form and in our soul form. Because okay. we all have the same parent God as well. So, but our spirit body and our physical body also all has the same parents, a mon and a man. Okay. So um, we are all technically, physically, spiritually, and at the soul level, brothers and sisters. So take, for example, I was to get involved with my soulmate. Yep. God wouldn't see that as me, like, um, having a relationship with my brother. In other words, as incest. Yeah. Well, let's define incest. What is incest? Well, take, for example, if I'm dating someone who's not my soulmate, and that's technically my brother. Is that technically, everybody is your brother. Yeah. Every male is your brother. So even my, soul, even my soulmate is. Yes, kind of technically. Okay. <laughs> the, difference between you and, the difference between the soul... So here's you, here's your soul, masculine and feminine. So there's the male part of your soul and there's you. Yeah. Right? So technically, you are one soul. Are you not? But if you look at your bodies, the male's body, so your soulmate's body and your bodies are all created by the same human couple. Are they not? Yeah. And so therefore, they, the bodies, the bodies themselves, are of the same genetic pool, if you trace it back far enough. Okay. Yeah. But take in today's society, if I was actually to have a relationship with my blood brother, mm -hmm. God, would God even design that? Well, firstly, you wouldn't have one with a brother as a child. It would, you would have to be an adult for you to be in harmony with love. When I say an adult, a person who's capable of making informed decisions about love is an adult, and, and, and that probably makes most of us not adults yet. <laughs> but anyway, um, if we could make informed decisions about love, then we, as an adult, that is very, very, very different to actually what you would call incest or child abuse, which is actually making a choice about having a relationship with a child. And so I'm not advocating that. But what I'm saying is historically, there is no reason if this genetic pool was perfected and there were no flaws in the genetics and the flaws in the genetics are created by the soul's condition. So once we all become at one with God on earth, technically there is no reason why as an adult we could not have a soulmate who happens to be our brother or sister. Because there's nothing genetically to stop it from harming us, to, to, to harm us. So just clarifying, say for example, um, I'm at one with God and my soulmate's at one with God and we're united and we have a girl baby and a boy baby and they could very well be soulmates. Well, there's a, po there's a possibility, a six billion to one possibility, but there's a possibility that they, could, that they could be and it not harm them. So that if, wouldn't be a If sin, you were both sort of at one with God. Okay. Mm. All right. Does that um, make sense to everyone? Yeah. If you're not at one with God, then you've got genetic impurities in your own body and genetic impurities exist in your partner's body. So when you have a, ch a child, those genetic impurities are passed down to the child along with the emotions that created the impurity. And then if your partner, the, the, you had another child and they happen to be soulmates, there is a potential of quite a lot of harm physically to their union if they became adults and then sexually united. Yeah. So that's why we have laws today that prevent such a thing from occurring. Yeah. yeah. Mind you, there's a lot of people who don't obey those laws. Mm. There's a lot of people on this planet right at the moment who have had, had children from their own brothers. A lot of women. A lot of women on this planet have had children from their own dads because of the issues of child abuse that many people face on the planet still. There's still a lot of that occurring, unfortunately. Mm. And my last question um, is kind of um, just an intellectual one, but I was curious. Um, what percentage of the world is with, with, um, with their soulmate? It's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? No, I don't. Uh. <laughs> no, I don't. 
I feel it's less than 1%, one, 1 though. That's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> and the 1% that are do not realise they're soulmates anyway, because they're living in addictions rather than living a soulmate relationship. Yeah. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. A soulmate relationship can only, is only possible when truth is perfectly open on both halves of the soul, even if you're soulmates. So, so for example, if we've got the two halves of the soul, and we have to come back to this question yet, if we've got two halves of the soul who are not yet joined, we'll choose a heterosexual soul. Um, the, the barriers between the two halves of the soul is all about errors or lies. Not just lies perpetrated by the two halves, but lies perpetrated upon the two halves by their environment. In other words, lies about the truth, about their existence. So that's, that forms like a barrier between the two halves of the soul. For the, for, they could be soulmates and still not be joined because of the errors of their environment and their own belief systems. The only thing that's going to join the two halves of the soul is truth. Once you get rid of truth, now emotion can flow. Once you in, introduce truth, sorry, emotion can now flow between the two halves of the soul, which have the effect of drawing the two halves of the soul together. Yeah. Right. So even the people on earth who have yet to meet their soulmates, or sorry, even the people on earth who have met their soulmates, <coughs> are not in a soulmate relationship because for the majority of them they've yet to remove the emotional barriers that cause them to believe the lies that have been perpetrated against us as humanity. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank so, you. Thanks, Anyway, it's uh, yeah, 20 past three, so I've already been going for uh, a bit longer than two and a half hours, uh, close to. Um, so what if we have a break till four o'clock, shall we? And then I'll return and I'll get on to answering this other, some other questions. Yeah.